Welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, the creator and founder of Genetic Insights and Feel Younger, Elwin Robinson. And it's been a little over a year since we launched this Rejuvenate Podcast, and we're really excited that we get to continue bringing everything to you. And today's episode, we thought we would answer some of our favorite questions that have come in from our lovely listeners over YouTube. So that is what we are going to do today. So Ellen, tell me, uh, what do you want to say to our listeners today with their, with their questions that they sent us? Hmm. Yeah, uh, I've been trying to answer every question that I get on YouTube, but there's only so much you can do, you know, within a, a sentence or two or whatever of YouTube to comment. And some of the questions are good and I think deserve a, a more full answers. Well, they're all good questions, but I mean, some of them deserve a more full answer. Um, I used to love listening to these Q&As. I, I realized an ideal thing might be to do them live, but honestly, I think you need a bit of a bigger following than we currently have at this stage. I think for every 100 viewers, you're probably only going to get one or two to show up live. <laughs> so uh, we're not quite at that stage yet, uh, I don't think, and because I, I realize it's hard to coordinate everyone for a live thing, but I would like to do those at some point. So I don't know if we're going to do these super regularly, but every now and then I thought it might be fun. I would say I've learned a lot from listening to these Q and A's from some of my favorite teachers over the years, going back even 15 years. Um, I think it used to be more common back when, uh, I don't know, I guess live Q and A's are a bit more difficult to do technologically. And I would often listen to these pre-recorded Q and A's and uh, learn a lot. And so I thought, yeah, let's just go through. And also just to show people that uh, we absolutely do care about your uh, interaction and feedback. Um, I have to say, there was definitely, there's a lot more comments than there are questions. There's a lot of people sharing their opinion, which is great. Um, we get lots of nice comments, which is good. We get some uh, critical comments, which is also good because I'm always open to uh, learning. Uh, but yeah, there are some really fascinating questions. So I thought, let's get into it. You know, with the timestamps that you always put together, Chrissy, I thought maybe people don't want to listen to the whole thing, but they might be specific questions that they want to listen to. So then you can just click on the timestamp and, and listen to the, the things that you're interested in. Beautiful. You know my process. <laughs> exactly. That's what we'll do as we put the as we go through the questions and and you feel free to skip ahead, skip around. Right. So let's get started with our very first one. Nice to meet you. Nice to hear from you. And the question is, this is amazing. Such an important conversation. Thank you to both you and Grant. I'm wondering about the pro vitamin A oils many of us women who are into natural organic beauty use on our face, e.g. rose hip seed oil, sea buckthorn, carrot seed oil, all the orangey natural oils. Would this also be applicable? Many thanks in advance. Absolutely. So yeah, that's in reference to our episode, which is the interview with Grant Genereux, where he talks about the potential dangers of excessive amounts of vitamin A. And that's all forms of vitamin A, including, yes, the plant form as well, the carotenoids, most famously beta carotene. And the answer to the question is, yeah, everything that we talked about, the dangers absolutely do apply to oils applied to your skin. Um, we also... I think, yeah, we'll definitely have come out at the time uh, before this comes out, have put out the interview with uh, Grant, Dr. Uh, Grant, uh, sorry, Dr. Garrett Smith, Garrett, who also yes. uh, teaches about the dangers of vitamin A. And uh, I think I think it was in the recording of the episode, he talked about one woman who uh, covered herself in carrot oil before going out and sunbathing. Yeah, you're nodding your head. Have I remembered that? Yeah, right? that's, yeah you, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And she got, bur you know, was it third degree burns? Third degree. Her body, he said. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is potentially problematic. So to go back to, OK, well, why is anyone recommending this then? I saw something else interesting, actually not from either of those two sources, but from someone else. You might know about this, Chrissy. You live in Hollywood adjacent. Um, that a lot of uh, Hollywood actors and stars and celebrities and models themselves stuff will actually use uh, large amounts of high beta carotene foods because it will give their skin a kind of orange hue, which is considered to be uh, more attractive. So a lot of them will do, you know, like loads of carrot juice and stuff like that on purpose to give themselves uh, that orange hue. So is that a bad thing? Why is that a bad thing? That's really what Grant explains in a lot more detail. But just go back to her question about the skin thing. Uh, to explain Grant's theory on that, really, in a nutshell, Putting vitamin A on your skin 
can it work to give you better looking skin, more youthful, more um, blemish free, whatever it may be? And the answer is yes. But what he says is it works in the same way as something like a chemical peel in that what it's doing, or maybe even exfoliator, I guess, if you want to be um, as fair as possible, what it's doing is it's burning away the top layers of the skin because it is so caustic. And of course, when you do that, the skin underneath looks better. It looks fresher, it looks less blemished, it looks less damaged by the sun and whatever else. So it will make you look better. But of course, famously, and I think you can, you probably have a lot more experience with this than me, Chrissy, but uh, I believe with those kind of uh, retinol and pro vitamin a topicals they recommend not to just keep using it like it stops working after a while you've got to kind of cycle them on and off is that right mm -hmm. yes i believe so yeah and so yeah his understanding of why that is is because when you are damaging those top layers of skin by applying something caustic like say carrot oil um you are burning away those top layers of skin and then the stem cells underneath the skin, which are always there because the, you know, the skin is constantly being replenished, those stem cells get used up a lot more quickly. And so to begin with, you look great and then after a while those stem cells get depleted and then that's where it stops being so effective. Uh, meanwhile, of course, anything that you're putting on your skin gets absorbed through your skin into your bloodstream. And so see all of Grant Jenneru's work for, you know, his case about why you would not want to have that stuff in your bloodstream. But yeah, now that's when we're talking about something that is a complex substance like sea buckthorn or carrot oil, of course, there's more to it than only the carotenoids in there. There's all kinds of other substances in there. Are some of the substances beneficial? Yeah, I was going to ask, you know, it's that kind of weighing the scale of it. What's beneficial out of it versus what's not? Exactly. Yeah. When you're talking about a drug or even an isolated compound, you know, uh, we've talked about how the line between drug and supplement and herb and food is kind of arbitrary. It, it really depends. But when you're talking about an isolated compound, it's easier to make a judgment call about whether it is good or not. At least even then, it depends on the person and the context and all the rest of it. For some people, it's worth it because it has a medicinal quality. For some people, it's not because they don't need that medicinal quality and it's just more poisonous. Um, but when it comes to uh, something that contains loads of these compounds, it's even harder to make that judgment. So if you love any of those things you just mentioned, um, viewer, whoever you are. A then... Reverse entropy, 5717. <laughs> I got it right this time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> then uh, by all means carry on using it, but just be aware of the potential dangers. Here's the thing I'll say on that subject as well. Like, it is true you can find something bad about pretty much everything. And so, and it's true if you have a certain kind of brain, uh, which I think I used to have, and I think I've retrained myself on this kind of often called a neurotic brain, a tendency to focus on the negative, then um, I know it's hard to let these things go once you hear something negative about something. But what I would say is, if you're going to choose to do something, whether that's eat pizza or smoke cigarettes or drink green juice or put uh, carrot oil on your skin, whatever it is you might be doing, if you're going to do it, just do it. Like the worrying about it and the stressing and the um, the, the negative thoughts and the imagining it's going to damage you and all of that kind of stuff is arguably just as bad for you as the actual substance itself. So make an informed choice, make an informed decision, and then just <laughs> stick Embrace with it. Embrace it and accept it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really good points, really good points. Beautiful. Well, thanks again, Reverse Entropy 5717s. Thank you for, for uh, you know, coming in with your question. And if you have any more questions, let us know. So our next question comes from Mary Pavitt 4312 She said, what do you think of kombucha? It kills hunger. I know nope, Mary. Hi, Mary. Uh, love Mary. Um, what do I think of it? I think that's another one of those case by case basis. Um, it killing hunger is not necessarily a good thing, by the way. Um, it, you know, it might be because it contains either sugar or alcohol. Uh, sugar, again, depending on who you're listening to and who you are, may or may not be a good thing. Alcohol generally a bit more questionable about its health benefits, although because it is a GABA agonist and it helps people relax, there are some indicators that for some people it is, they're better off poisoning themselves a little bit with a little bit of alcohol and relaxing than they are not. Um, but yeah, overall- Does, Let me ask you this. Does kombucha have some, do some kombuchas have caffeine as well? Oh yeah, and that, yeah, yeah. And you're right, that is another, actually a really good point um, because caffeine as a stimulant, 
which will increase adrenaline and uh, noradrenaline and those will reduce hunger. So that could be another reason why it reduced hunger, absolutely. So there's a lot of reasons why it could be reducing hunger for you. Uh, is it beneficial? That's so idiosyncratic. We've talked about that before, the microbiome, how I still stand by my statement a while ago that there's much more we don't know about it than that we do know about it. And you'll see two people with very similar microbiomes who, uh, you know, have one's really healthy and the one isn't. And you'll see people with wildly different microbiomes who are both really healthy. So it, it's not that simple. But uh, if your microbiome responds to it if you feel better overall from having it in your digestive system if you feel you know some of the signs of warmth if not just energy because unfortunately energy can just be adrenal activity but if you feel for instance warmer if your core gets warmer that's a good sign a reasonably good sign that it's actually increasing your energy uh, if you feel you know hungry regularly that's a good sign that it's doing something good for your digestion uh, i mean you know i won't go through the full list i guess most people know what it is but yeah look for those signs of whether it's beneficial for you i guess because there's a big list of reasons why it might be good for you and there's also a big list of reasons why it might not be so Beautiful. Well, Mary, check those out. And you can also refer to some of our earlier episodes, especially around metabolism and thyroid and things like that, to, to uh, look at the reference list that Ellen was talking about. But again, thanks for your question. All right, moving on, we've got, uh, please, again, if I mess up the names, don't shoot me. <laughs> Ronnie, Ronnie Five, um, is it okay or is it not true that your digestive system isn't ready for food first thing in the morning? Doesn't TCM also say the digestive fire doesn't peak till midday? What would you recommend in that case? Would it be okay to have juice or tea with honey just to get some glucose? Great question. Um, it's funny that they mention TCM because everything that I'm familiar with TCM absolutely says that you do need to eat in the morning. Yes, they do say that the digestive fire is strongest uh, in the middle of the day when the sun is at its peak at its zenith or whatever. So uh, yeah, I don't disagree with that. But uh, TCM, like, so out of the kind of ancient systems. Ayurveda is much more on the side of detoxing and fasting, but TCM is much less into that and much more into uh, bringing things into balance um, and then uh, clearing away block blockages in chi, but then also building up, you know, so building up blood, building up chi. And so they really talk about how uh, if you don't eat enough, and that includes not eating in the morning, then your body is uh, kind of cannibalizing itself to some degree. That's how they would talk about it in energetic terms, going back a long way. And science is really actually finding that's the case, right? If you do not eat pretty quickly after you wake up, your body goes into glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, basically uh, uh, li uh, lipolysis, basically breaking down your muscles to free up some amino acids for energy, breaking up your fats to get some fats out for energy and uh, liberating some carbohydrate, some sugar from storage in your muscles and your liver. Now that may seem like a good thing, especially if you're trying to lose weight, but the problem is th this uh, uh, issue of the Randall cycle, which we talked about a lot in the uh, Ray Pete episodes, where, and also a little bit in the insulin resistant episodes, where free fatty acids liberated by uh, lipolysis will actually exacerbate and some people would say cause insulin resistance which means that your body is not able to handle glucose properly and produce energy properly and your metabolism could slow down and uh, it can be a root cause of a lot of issues so um, there are a lot of reasons I would say also to not fast first thing in the morning. The other thing is that in order to do that, liberate that energy from the muscles, from storage in, the, um, in glucose and from fat, your body has to increase stress chemicals, it has to increase cortisol, adrenaline, noradrenaline as part of that liberating energy from storage. Once your body has those stress chemicals high, it's quite hard to get them low again. Um, often your body will overshoot so the, the blood sugar will go too high then the insulin will go too high to compensate for it and then the blood sugar will go too low and then you're on this blood sugar roller coaster for the rest of the day which people are not always aware of like 
people aren't always aware or they may not identify as hypoglycemic, but if your energy goes up and down throughout the day or if your mood goes up and down throughout the day, if some, t- some points you feel depressed, some points you feel anxiety, all that kind of stuff, some points you feel depression, if you, some points you feel uh, anger, a lot of the time, look, that could be because of all kinds of complicated issues, but usually one of the best starting points is, have I had enough sleep? Have I had a bowel movement? And am I hungry? <laughs> And usually, if you deal with those three things, uh, it actually resolves uh, most of the upset in most people's life, it turns out. It really is as simple as that. Um, let me ask you this. Are you a fan of those um, constant, those glucose monitors, monitors that are out? Because then that could also help show people like what they're you know, experiencing. I am, their... yeah. I okay. can't. Uh, recommend them too glowingly because I haven't tried it myself, but I'm a fan of the concept definitely so that people have awareness. Any kind of biofeedback, I'd call that biofeedback, where you can kind of see what's going on in your body and it, it lets you know and you can adjust accordingly, I think is a very positive thing so long as the person doing it is not too du- neurotic, which I have at a stage in my life of, oh my God, you know, my, my heart rate's up, my heart rate's down, my, bl- my glucose's up, my glucose's down, oh my God. So if you're in that kind of space, then it's maybe better not to know. But so long as you're <laughs> able to take it without being overwhelmed, then I think it is really good to get that feedback. And I, I would like to try one. I didn't love the idea of something being, uh, you know, inserted yeah. inside yeah. me 24 hours a day, but I do really love the uh, the concept. Yeah, yeah. No, agreed. I'm interested in them too. I haven't haven't experienced it yet, but beautiful. Okay, and, thank and you. Sorry, and sorry, and just to address, like the concept of, but Elway, what about intermittent fasting and all that kind of stuff? We we talked about that a lot already in the insulin resistance episodes and the hypoglycemia episodes. So I'd refer people to that for a deeper dive on that. But basically, breakfast, yeah, I recommend to everyone. It was not easy to convince you of this, right, Chrissy? No, um, exactly. <laughs> but eventually you started eating, what, within an hour of waking up? or De- Yeah, like definitely. And it's it's interesting because I always thought you should work out fasted, this and that, or I was, you know, have, pushing my eating to like 10 o'clock or stuff like that. But when I started, it was a little bit hard to get into the process of it. But once I was there, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm seeing some benefits. I'm, I'm more stable for sure, which was nice. And there's sometimes there's times where I'm not as hungry. I'll still eat. I will still have something that just doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a big meal, but I'm trying to make sure it's got a good amount of, you know, protein, carbs, fat. So it's, um, how can you say balanced in that regard? But, um, yeah, it, it, (laughs) it took me a little bit. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I understand because it's going against programming. And again, not that I'm always right. It's just I re- you know, recommend people try stuff and you know, it's a good thing to try for a while. Um, but yeah, I would say uh, the less you feel like doing it, actually probably the more you need to because... Exactly. That was the other point too, yeah, that we talked about. Yeah. Like if you feel really hungry and you're applying discipline and willpower to fast... Okay, there's actually studies showing that's good. It's like stimulating, you know, ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone, which then stimulates growth hormone. And, you know, there might be, and obviously there's autophagy and lots of things going on. What concerns me is if someone doesn't even want to eat for a few hours when they're woken up, that's because their adrenaline is so high that they are not hungry. And that is not a sustainable way of moving through life. And so that's where I'd want to kind of resolve that. And, uh, but yeah, so yeah, ironically, the less you want to do it, the more you should do it. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality, affordable supplements that Elwin and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers, but the prices are very affordable. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're really helpful and friendly. And what I love most of all is the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it. I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have for most articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code rejuvenateme for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code rejuvenateme at feelyounger.net. Wonderful. So moving on to the next question, um, you're going to like this name, Bobby Pukes 605. (laughs) 
here we go. Elwin, I would like to know what your diet consists of. Yeah, wow, this is a, a tricky one. So it's tricky because just because I have it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do for you. You know, I, I would really refer people to my um, Feel Younger Diet video to go through the process of working out what is right for you. I think what you and I even eat, Chrissy, is pretty different. And that's totally fine, right? The, the, there is no dogmatic, this is right or this is wrong. Um, but I'll talk about where I get my nutrients from. How about that? So I get most of my fat from a combination of four things. MCT oil, which I have usually about a tablespoon every meal. Uh, cheese, I usually have sheep or goat cheese. Um, coconut butter, I don't always have that because I already have the MCT oil. And then butter, that would be the other thing. I get most of my carbohydrate from starch. I know that um, we have a lot of Ray P fans, they're gonna say that's a bad idea. They may be right that ultimately fruit is better. There's fierce debate on that subject, obviously. Some people say fructose is terrible, some people say it's the best. Um, I, I haven't come to a conclusion about it, but all I know is that for me, fructose doesn't agree with me like starch does. And so that's why I go for starch. Best starches for me, uh, I primarily have p potato, and I go for um, gluten-free sourdough bread. The only actual intolerance I have, I discovered, was uh, gluten. That's that's something that I have genuinely have an issue with. Um, oh, and soy, sorry, those two. But yeah, everything else that you know used to bother me, actually, it wasn't really an intolerance. Um, and uh, so, and then uh, protein, most importantly. I get from uh, a combination of cheese again, uh, goats and sheep cheese, uh, beef, and in beef I go, f it's like always collagen and sometimes muscle meat. Uh, and that's really where I get those from. I have vegetables some of the time um, and I really go along with the, I guess, both the carnivore stroke uh, doctor, Smith kind of school of thought on this that actually a lot of the bright colors in foods are uh, plant defense chemicals rather than these wonderful healing substances. Now there are exceptions to that. There are exceptions to that that I use, um, but I like to treat them as medicines rather than foods. So right, right, right. Using them at appropriate times and things. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I don't you know, have anything sulfurous for reasons I talked about recently in the episode with uh, Dr. Garrett Smith. Uh, I agree on his take on that. It slows down the aldehyde gene uh, and I, mine is already slow genetically, it's, uh, you know, in my um, in my genetic reports. So that's the reason. But if you have a, f you know, very good functional aldehyde gene, then there are some benefits to sulfurous food. So maybe that's fine for you, you know. Um, there are specific organisms that that may be beneficial, that may be inside you and not me, that really enjoyed those brightly colored um, substances like polyphenols or uh, flavonoids or whatever. And so maybe you love having blueberries or tomatoes or whatever, and they agree with you. That's fine too, you know? Like this really is quite an individual thing, but I, I you know, because I'm still trying to optimize, I am not having anything that I feel like stresses my system. Um, so yeah, it's like the really the most, so a basic kind of meal, meat, potato, bread and cheese. I mean, that sounds like the least healthy diet around. And now, admittedly, it is organic goat and sheep's cheese. Admittedly, it is organic 100% grass-fed, you know, uh, uh, ruminant meat. Admittedly, it is, uh, you know, gluten-free sourdough bread, um, you know, whatever. It's like the best version of all of those things. But still, it's um, very, very uh, moderate. It's funny. Uh, you know, I just did an interview recently with Hans Amoto, which I think again will be out by the time uh, this comes out. And, you know, he's more from the Ray Pete school of um, doing things. And yeah, I, I was interested to see that his basic dietary advice was actually the same as Dr. Smith's basic dietary advice. Although I know there's a massive uh, fight between those two camps about who's right and who's wrong about vitamin A. But I was interested to see that that's where there was an overlap, that basically eating animal foods, you know, beef, cheese, for someone else, maybe fish, 
chicken, that's fine too. I don't want fish or chicken, but you may, that's totally fine. Um, to me, yes, chicken is not as good as beef, I would say simply because it's higher in omega-6. Fish is not as good because it's always contaminated with a lot of heavy metals and other toxins. But still, if it's what agrees with you, then it's better for you. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically a simple carb, whether it's potato, whether it's white rice, you know, Hans also recommended bananas or another option. Uh, Dr. Smith recommends apples as another option. So a simple carb with a simple protein, uh, not super high fat. I do better with high fat, so I kind of cheat with that by having quite a lot of MCT oil. So I have quite a lot of calories coming from fat, but most of them are MCT oil, which is a very easy to digest fat. So there's still not much of a strain on the liver. And I uh, don't have any issue with, you know, putting on too much weight. So that's not a reason for me to avoid fat. Yeah, that's a good point. And as we, in our genetic ep episodes, in our genetic nutrients reports, we looked at that, like, I think you were fine with fats. I wasn't. So it's like, I was going to ask you about, you know, it's making sure that your, how could I say your macro ratios, you know, are are working within that space because that's the other thing about certain meats too they can also be quite high in fat so it's finding that balance that works for you your genetic and how you feel and honestly even animal fat as in like beef fat doesn't really agree with me that much for some reason dairy fat and coconut fat does so i will have lean meats usually if it's a treat then a filet if you know standard it's just lean minced beef um and uh but yeah, dairy fats. And interestingly, you know, I recently came across this thing about odd chain fatty acids, which are um, and not, there's not enough known about them compared to, you know, omega threes that are like super popular. Um, but odd chain fatty acids are highest in dairy and in uh, uh, fish as well, to some degree. And so there's some speculation, maybe some of the benefits of eating fish that were assumed to be coming from omega three might actually be coming from those odd chain fatty acids. And also, there's like uh, benefits to some dairy that is not understood because it shouldn't be there. Like the famous ice cream thing where people who eat ice cream are healthier than people who don't. And it's like, how can that be possible? And, you know, there's various speculation, but I, I suspect that the odd chain fatty acids may be one of the reasons. Uh, Cause obviously dairy does have um, vitamin A. And so everyone watching me who's in the Garrett Smith, Grant Jinneru campus probably, oh, he, he eats dairy, how could he? That's the only thing that I have with vitamin A in. I don't have any other foods with vitamin A in. I don't have any other supplements with vitamin A in um, or any carotenoids or anything like that. But for me, and I don't know if it's partly my ancestry, like I'm half Dutch. Uh, the Dutch people famously maybe more dairy than any other country in the world, which is also why I believe that they're the tallest nation, nation in the world. Um, it just seems to agree with me a surprising amount. Uh, and so, uh, and I, I'm also not sure about the vitamin A levels in European dairy that I buy straight from the farm because all of, I know vitamin A is added to US dairy, is fortified with it. Um, and I haven't been able to get a straight answer yet. I know we don't fortify with it in the UK, but what I am not sure about is how much there actually is in the UK dairy that hasn't been fortified with vitamin A. I'm sure it's still something, but it, I'm saying it may well be less than the amounts that you see for uh, US dairy. So I need to find out more about that. So anyway, yeah, the most, I don't know, boring or, but it, I, I, I do not feel any lack of anything. So I don't have anything sweet, but I don't, ha you know, have anything desire for anything sweet. Oh, if I'm having a, a like a, a treat or, or, you know, cheat or whatever, uh, I, I have, sometimes have these gluten-free pretzels made with like cassava flour. That's like, as crazy as I get. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. he's breaking out the, the pretzels. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> but yeah, like honestly, like I have no desire for, or, uh, oh, and sometimes I have potato chips again made with like co coconut oil. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, meat is so satisfying. Cheese is so satisfying. And then I don't find them satisfying on their own because I also need carbs. But then, you know, like potato and um I don't really like white rice, but if people like that, that's great as well. You know, that's so satisfying that I honestly don't feel like I'm I'm lacking anything with that diet. It feels uh, feels really good to me. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Owen. Um, I did have one question. What do you, where is your stance on beans? Yeah, I was I I actually really like beans. I know that's unusual for people to say. Uh, I really enjoy kind of like chili with beans and stuff like that. Uh, I was having them for a while. Um, I was having them before you know, for a few years when I was not really focused much on health because I was feeling great, I would have them regularly then just because I enjoyed them. 
And then I started having them again for a while last year because uh, Grant Genero was recommending black beans along with beef. And so I, that's basically the diet I tried for a while. Um, they don't super disagree with me, but I just find that the potatoes are better. I can see the benefit of the beans because they, um, uh, p potentially because they have higher protein than potato. Although according to Ray Pete, the protein in potatoes is uh, very high quality and well absorbed and all the rest of it. Uh, and then I think black beans, especially they also like as the pectin, which uh, helps to soak up heavy metals and other toxins. So I can see the benefit in it. Um, but it is full of what are called FODMAPs, which irritate uh, irritable bowel syndrome and feed, you know, bacteria. And I think uh, certainly repeat followers would not be recommending beans, I'm pretty sure. Um, and a lot of people don't recommend beans. I mean, other than kind of raw food community that recommends or like vegans that recommend sprouted beans. I think beans are rarely on the list of like superfoods on anyone's list. Uh, I know, you know, Dr. Gundry, for instance, very big following now. And, you know, he pushes a strict like anti-beans because they're full of lectins. Uh, so I never find them to be a significant issue to digest them. But I just stopped because I just didn't feel optimal. Yeah. Okay. Good you? point. Yeah. No, as well, I grew up on black beans. I'm half Cuban, so that's a very big staple. So I don't think I could ever give those up. Do you to still be like fair. them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, as I said, I like them, but yeah, it's just not optimal. I'm trying to go for optimal for now. Yeah, exactly. And you, you know, you mentioned a really great word right there, which is optimal optimization. And that's one of the things I've recently I've really been trying to pay attention to. It's how is my body feeling after eating this thing? And I've tried to take my meals down to simplicity, like just a few items in them so I can really see, is my body feeling bloated after this? Do I feel energy or do I feel tired? You know, really, I'm trying to investigate that a little bit more so I can really feel and experience what effect the food is having on me. Yeah, that is really the key. Yeah. And, you know, a step by step process, we talk through in the feel younger diet, you know, how to uh, tackle that med uh, methodically, methodically. But uh, yeah, that is it. And that's your Chrissy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, perfect. Beautiful. So moving on to the next question, it is from Vanilla Ghetto. And they say seems odd that you didn't discuss any differences between men and women taking DHEA supplements. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think the reason is because there isn't a massive difference. So in either case, um, it, okay, so DHEA is the precursor for testosterone and estrogen. Um, there's not much of a difference, basically because I'm concerned with the same thing with both. The reason why I don't recommend a large amount uh, to either sex without monitoring is because if you have too much in either case, then it will lead to too much estrogen um, or it can lead to too much estrogen. And that's the thing you want to monitor for and be aware of. And it's why a lot of doctors don't you know, recommend too much to begin with, or they only recommend it with monitoring. Um, I can see what the person's coming from because they're worried about the potential for uh, perhaps it also leading to too much testosterone for women because DHEA can also be converted into testosterone. But I think, I believe that the reason why n no one really talks about that is because it's not an issue in practice, even though it is in theory. And I know you're recording the interview soon with Dr. Miriam, where you're going to talk about female health. So you can clarify that with her because she's got a lot of clinical experience with giving women DHEA. Um, but I believe it's the same issue with women as it is men. In either case, the main issue is, is it converting into too much estrogen? Uh, I don't believe that too much testosterone, because women don't convert much DHEA to testosterone naturally. Um, some women have too much testosterone, uh, but you know, most women by the time when they're in the 40s and 50s and they're looking for bioidentical hormone optimization, they're actually given testosterone, bioidentical hormone doctor. They're not um, given estrogen and often they're given you know things like dim and calcium glucurate to try and reduce the estrogen so uh, it, you know in theory i know that the, there can be pcos for instance which is a you know a too much a, a testosterone issue um, but outside those kind of medical conditions it's not usually a thing i think that's why i, I treat it as the same beautiful and now our next question comes from john wilson 681 have you ever tried pregnenolone yes I have. Um, <laughs> I don't like pregnenolone as much as progesterone uh, or, you know, testosterone, DHT, whatever, 
uh, allopregnanolone, all these other things that I've tried, uh, because of the lack of control, because it could turn into anything. And, you know, we just talked about how DHEA can turn into estrogen. Well, pregnenolone can turn into estrogen. Now, pregnenolone is more likely to turn into progesterone because that's kind of like a next step for it. Um, but pregnenolone absolutely can turn into cortisol. So I know Ray P was a big fan of pregnenolone. That's probably where the question is coming from. Uh, that's probably underneath a Ray P episode. Um, he believed, you know, that a person could have several grams of it even and there was no risk. I think it was probably right medically, as in, you know, like a doctor would not be panicked if you came and told them that you'd done that. But anecdotally, I have seen so many people who, when they take even relatively small amounts of pregnant alone, have unpleasant side effects and stop taking it. And I have to say, I think I was one of them, although it wasn't right. very significant. What were, those, um, what were those unpleasant side effects? Stress. Just It just felt like it was turning into cortisol. It felt like a stimulant. It didn't feel uh, like a good thing to me. So um, I don't know if that's what's going on. Some people deny that. They say, no, that's not what it is. It's it's turning into estrogen, and that's why you feel stressed. Okay, that may be the case. I, I, but you don't want that either. <laughs> yeah, but the bottom line is I think a lot of people feel agitated from it um, to various degrees. And so that's why I much prefer to actually take the downstream uh, metabolite. Now, ironically, if you're taking the downstream metabolite, that actually is a good case of taking pregnenolone. Um, so meaning if you're suppl like, if you are taking TRT, or if you are doing bioidentical hormone replacement as a woman, you know, you're probably on bioidentical progesterone or something, then actually it makes sense to have a bit of pregnenolone, because whenever you supplement one of the downstream metabolites, it can kind of imbalance everything else. Now, in the case of a woman having progesterone, you could argue that that's not a bad thing because you want the um, the balance to shift towards progesterone dominance rather than estrogen dominance, so maybe that's okay. Uh, but still, overall, I would be... Um, I think like having a small amount of pregnenolone can be a good idea. Now, the other thing about taking pregnenolone is if your cholesterol is not high and if your uh, thyroid is in a good place, your T3 is really right at the top of that reference range. That's where you want it. Um, or even a bit higher. Though. Don't tell anyone I said that. Um, then the, what, probably you'll be converting the, enough cholesterol to um, pregnenolone yourself. And so then you don't need to supplement the pregnenolone. The reason why most of us are depleted in pregnenolone is because we're not converting enough cholesterol to pregnenolone. Um, or we're taking things that are blocking the cholesterol, but let's assume that you know, we're not doing that. We're not having statins or anything like that. Um, so there are many cases where pregnenolone may be beneficial, but uh, I, those are the reasons why I personally don't use it. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. It's more to look into for that. It's, you know, trying to figure out what's right for somebody may not be right for somebody else either. Our next question comes from Analia Dragonova 3504. She says, great information. Thank you. First time I heard about progesterone cream benefits besides on correcting women's hormonal imbalance was from the work of the late Dr. John Lee. I would like to ask a question. How would progesterone cream be applied for young women in, sorry, this is just going over here, in their 20s for correcting adrenaline dominance. Dr. John Lee suggests progesterone is uh, that you start on the eighth day of the menstrual cycle and stop 24 to 48 hours from the expected date of the next menstrual cycle. Is it correct, this method of application, or would you suggest a different regiment of application? Thank you in advance. Yeah, good question. I'm guessing this is underneath the Dr. Michael Platt interview, uh, and I think he references John Lee a couple of times. I think... Um, John Lee ended up being a lot more famous for whatever reason, but Dr. Platt was, you know, also at the forefront of the progesterone kind of revolution or bioidentical progesterone. Um, I think they had some disagreements, notably, I think, about dose, but I think they were in perfect agreement about that. So seven to 10 days after day one of the cycle is when you would start it again, and then you stop. I mean, 20... The only thing about 24 hours before expected is because you actually never know when it's quite going to hit, right? <laughs> you have a yeah, rough even idea. for the most regular, sometimes <laughs> it's a little hit and miss, yeah. It could be off by a day or so. So 
my understanding is you just stop as soon as it starts, as opposed to trying to predict when it starts and stopping 24 hours before. I have not heard of uh, needing to stop 24 hours before. I know Dr. Platt doesn't recommend that. Um, again, you could ask Dr. Miriam that uh, maybe in your interview and see what her take on that is. But uh, I'm pretty sure cause she also works with Hannah, my wife. I'm pretty sure she hasn't told her to do that. So, uh, yeah, it's not something that I've heard of. But other than that, I agree 100 percent. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, next question comes from Sullivan Kelly, 85. Hi, Ellen. Great video. I'm 40 and following a pro metabolic diet, 208 number eat 3,800 to 4,000 plus calories per day while slowly gaining muscle. If I wanted to, if I wanted to introduce short fasts to slowly start shredding, shedding fat without sacrificing muscle, any tools you recommend methylene blue, for example? Uh, yeah. Hi, Sullivan. I like your comments. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if I would do short fasts. Um, if I were trying to shred, what I would probably do is uh, higher protein, lower carbs rather than fasting. Now, is low carb a good thing? We've talked about this a lot on this uh, channel. Probably not necessarily. But remember, fasting is low carb and low protein and low fat. It's low everything. So um, I would say in preference to low everything, why not just go low carb, but still high protein, maybe moderate fat, uh, so that then your body still has those building blocks of muscle. And I think that is often how it is done in the bulking phase. I believe phase. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Because you want, you're wanting to educate the body like, no, we want to keep the protein. <laughs> We're still building it. So here's the building blocks for it. And in terms of supplements, I would say, you know, creatine is an obvious one. Um, HMB I'm quite a fan, on as, a fan of as well. Some people, you know, say that it's not really any more effective than leucine and so they're not a big fan of it. But I think HMB has a few advantages over leucine. Um, it's more expensive, but it's still not very expensive. I think you can still get a kilo for 20 or $30 or something and you only need like a gram per day. So it's not you know, a significant expense anyway, even if it's more expensive than leucine. Um, Leucine is uh, really foul tasting as a free form amino acid, at least, or, you know, in the form of BCAAs or EAAs, like you take, Chrissy. Um, it's the bitter part of those formulas. Um, and it's uh, well, it's more bulky as well. So you get, yes, you could get the same effect by having a certain amount of leucine, but you can get, you know, I can't remember exactly what it is, but five or 10 grams worth of anabolic effect from leucine you can get from one gram of HMB. So yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of HMB and there's you know plenty of studies to show that it helps uh, to build that muscle mass pretty effectively. So uh, I've also heard of a dilucine peptide, although I haven't tried that myself, um, but I can't really see why it's any if more effective than HMB. Uh, so, but you know, for some, everyone's different. So that would be more what I would focus on. Uh, rather than fasting altogether, keep having the protein, uh, moderate amount of fat, moderate to low amount of carbs. Um, but yeah, keep the protein to keep the muscle. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. 
Well, Ellen, we uh, hear it's not necessarily a question, but I want to throw in from um, somebody that said, hey, Ellen, just wanted to reach out and say how much I have loved your podcast. Talking about advanced topics, not sure that's the right term, or more niche things that I kind of understood, but you helped me dig way deeper on. There's not a name here, but that's just a, a comment there. And then there's another one from FemC underscore kids, loving these podcasts and listening to your journey. Thanks so much. And clear your mind uh, org at Elwyn. You were right. I didn't follow Pete's advice about thyroid. I just listened to your episodes about thyroid and got myself a prescription and it made a huge difference. Thanks. Okay. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, so there's a few. And, and uh, we've got a question coming in from Stefan Silvestri, 7143. What do you think about Dr. Ray Pete advising rather to take pregnenolone, the master hormone, which converts to progesterone, which itself converts to allopregnenolone? Would not that be safer? And also, I think you can supplement pregnenolone more often than allopregnenolone. Uh, yeah, I think I've just addressed why I prefer the metabolites over pregnenolone. So um, the other one may have even be a, no, I think it was by a different person. But anyway, uh, yeah, I don't. I haven't seen any research that uh, you should not do too much allopregnenolone. I know that the way that it's used in a therapeutic ses, uh, setting is to give a massive dose over IV over the course of four days, such a large dose that the person has to be constantly monitored that their heart rate doesn't go too slow and that they don't fall and crack their heads because it's such a powerful GABA agonist. So I'm aware of that. Um, but I don't, I have not seen that that is for anything other than like a way of justifying charging $40,000 to it. I don't see why doing a massive amount of dose over the course of a few days um, is safe and yet doing a small amount regularly over the course of weeks months or years is somehow unsafe uh, i haven't seen any evidence of that at all if you have any please share it beautiful yeah yeah keep those uh you know sh keep sharing with us it helps us grow and it helps us give more information to you so please put that in the comments for us um this is from mike home 9548 i took accutane when i was young and i think it messed me up really bad i have a feeling of inflamed dry nose and throat and eyes at night which has been the cause of my insomnia for more than 10 years now wow the resulting chronic fatigue both mental and physical muscular is very debilitating any suggestions on best cures uh, slash relievers if any exist yeah i'm sorry to hear that accutane is a... devastating isn't it yeah um what would i say i would say um look at the work of grant genero and dr garrett smith both of whom have been on this channel um check out the interviews with them follow up with them um Dr. Garrett Smith, he teaches a lot of other stuff other than about vitamin A, but you may want to try his method. You may want to try Grant's method. Grant isn't a teacher, uh, you know, as it were, telling you what to do, but you could follow his example if you want to. And of course, you could listen to what, you know, we say on this channel, because we do recommend a largely vitamin A-free uh, lifestyle. And yeah, I guess that gets to the crux of it, which is if you've had such a large amount of vitamin A, your body has... Uh, in the well, the most toxic form of uh, vitamin A, the I think it's thirteen cis retinoic acid, then you have been poisoned by retinoic acid. And even if you don't believe that vitamin A or retinoic acid are innately poisonous, and I know that most people don't, and that's a very controversial subject, you could still maybe accept that given what the amount of that most toxic version of the, that drug has done to you that you have had too much of it even if you don't believe it's innately poisonous and so i if i were in your position uh would be number one avoiding all forms of exposure to vitamin a i would be stricter with if i were you than i'm with me like i talked earlier in this episode i still have some dairy uh i would not have any dairy i would not have anything with any vitamin a not on my skin not consuming, not in any form. Um, obviously, yeah, do I think your best Dr. Smith did say, you know, Dr. Smith did say, like, you can't get it completely out of the diet, but do everything that you can to absolutely minimize whatever intake of it as yeah. possible. Yeah, yeah, not to zero, but to 0 0.1, you know, whatever. Yeah, as little as possible. Um, and then, yeah, support the process of uh, it moving out of your body. And 
the interview that we did with Dr. Smith recently on that subject, it, I think, is very good. He shares some of his latest strategies as well. Um, uh, and so the episode that we did on uh, detoxification of liver, toxic barfear and cholestasis, that's a really good one to listen to as well. So it's really a combination of two things. Reduce the amount coming in as much as possible and then support the body in getting it out as quickly and smoothly and easily as possible. Um, but yeah, definitely watch our most recent episode on detoxification because you talk about make, uh, helping the body get it out of the system, which so many of us may not even know that our bodies are struggling to do that. So that's a really good episode to watch. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, I would say... Uh, I can't answer it in a short time other than to recommend all those resources. But if, yeah, if you follow what those say, then you'll get better. Wonderful. Next question we have is from Big Bank, Big Banky B. Uh, does topical progesterone, lots of progesterone questions coming in. Does topical progesterone stop your body's natural endogenous production? If not, what is the reference for this? Why does it not have a similar effect men taking testosterone? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it has this you know, very special role where it can take the place of almost every other uh, steroid hormone. Steroid meaning simply made out of cholesterol. So, you know, cortisol is a steroid hormone. So it can fulfill the function of almost every steroid hormone, I think, except for testosterone and estrogen. And so uh, I would speculate that because it has such a wide variety of... Um, that you could body can use it in so many different ways and so many different purposes. The the level that the body considers a tolerable level of progesterone can fluctuate pretty widely. Of course, for women, they go uh, from having whatever level they have to, I believe it's a hundred times as much in their body during pregnancy. And again, there isn't this mechanism to you know bring it right back to what is normal. Like it, there's a there's a lot of leeway, right? So if there is a lot of leeway, then that means that just because your body has a lot more doesn't mean you stop producing it. Unlike testosterone, where there's not a lot of leeway, where there's a fairly tight range that it needs to stay in. And this is true for a lot of different things. Not for all of them. So for estrogen, it can just keep going higher and higher. That's a bad thing. Um, but for a lot of things like thyroid hormone, uh, like testosterone, like DHEA as well, your body wants to keep it within a fairly tight range and so that's where the down regulation happens more so why do you think that the body has such a tight leash on certain um hormones or neurotransmitters because i know it also down regulates dopamine as well why do you think that is where others it can just be like no just keep going well yeah, it's a complicated one to answer. And again, I'm in the realm of speculation because I'm not God, right? I didn't create the universe. Uh, but uh, I, I, I believe it's because with a lot of those, like too much thyroid, for instance, will over uh, stimulate the metabolism. It will cause too much uh, mitochondrial activity. It will create too much uh, carbon dioxide, too many free electrons, whatever. It will, it will overload you. That's called hyperthyroidism that's dangerous. Uh, too much testosterone will also imbalance things. Now, the reason why it's a bit complicated and I have to think about it for a second is because also too much estrogen is a problem. But for whatever reason, uh, I think it's probably because the, the, the issues of too much estrogen are very, very common in this day and age, but I, they were not very common throughout most of history. That would be what I would assume like estrogenic foods were relatively rare up until recently estrogen in the water was relatively rare xenoestrogens didn't exist so i would say that even though too much estrogens are equally a problem they're more of a chronic long-term problem and they're more of a recent problem evolutionarily so i think that is probably why it is um the other answer i was going to give is this is all just speculation again i'm not god i didn't create the, the laws of uh, biochemistry but just on a practical level, doctors very frequently prescribe testos uh, progesterone to people and have no concern um, about them running out and not having any more. It's totally fine. Like the body just picks up production very easily. Oh, and of course, the other thing is with the women's cycle. We just mentioned that a few questions ago. 
some parts of the cycle the woman is taking progesterone, some parts she isn't. Like, it's okay to have that up and down, to go from a high amount of progesterone to a low amount of progesterone. In fact, it's not just okay, it's essential for the creation of life <laughs> to occur. So, um, yeah, there's just that massive amount of flexibility with progesterone. Cortisol is another one, I believe, where there is quite a large amount of uh, flexibility. There, there is more of an upper limit, like um, with progesterone, there seems to be almost no upper limit. With pregnenolone, there seems to be almost no upper limit, at least from a medical point of view, as we discussed earlier. Um, but with some of them, yeah, there definitely is that upper limit that is uh, more dangerous. So I think because there isn't that upper limit, the body doesn't really downregulate. And because it's so essential, even if the body did downregulate, it would very quickly uh, start up production again. Great, great, great. And so a couple more um, comments here. Uh, Faultguard9618, thank you for talking fast and getting to the points. A lot of YouTube channels make me cringe on this stuff, but this is listenable. <laughs> and um, Mary Pavitt4312 for again here. Thank you, Ellen Blumen, great. Uh, Colmere, fascinating, very informative, insightful, and comprehensive. I've learned a lot. Thank you. And then one more, uh, Lizzo Basuki8765. I really appreciate these videos you're making at the moment, Elwin and Chrissy. I know how much hard work and time it takes to compare and contrast all of the different, different views and dietary theories that are out there. So, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, ne next question coming in. Yoga with Naz. Would progesterone cream interfere with contraception? The hormone coil, as you say that it helps with getting pregnant and not having miscarriages, but what if you want to take it just to relax? Um, okay, so does it, sorry, what's the question? Does it interfere with other birth control methods? Yes, is it, would it inter interfere with contraceptive, contraception? Well, yeah, it's kind of irrelevant with condoms and stuff, but I guess uh, they mean like a birth control pill. Uh, I'm guessing, or yeah, coil. Well, she said the the, the yeah the coil there because the the hormones are being released. So the coil, I I, I associate that with the copper coil. Is that right? Or I'm, it might be. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the that type of with yeah. Coils I think or things I like think that. the only coil that I know of is the copper coil. So that's an issue where the copper is of such a high level um, in that area that it basically uh, stops um, the um, reproductive process happening I'll just keep it as simple as that I know Dr. Gareth Smith goes into quite a lot of detail about why that is the case and why it's such a terrible thing he's really not a big fan of copper I hope to have him on again to actually get into copper uh, but anyway so that's really working for a completely different mechanism um, the birth control pill some of them are utilizing estrogen and some of them are utilizing the synthetic form of progesterone um I'm not actually sure where this question is coming from. Are they saying, like, I'm trying to stop getting pregnant. Will this make me more likely to get pregnant? Do you think that's where they're coming from? I think they're coming in from, I don't want to get pregnant. And is this potentially going to make me get pregnant? One. And then the second one is, like, um, you know, and not having miscarriages. But what if I just want to take it to relax and not have anything to do with trying to get pregnant? Yeah. Okay. So... I would and by say, the way, if that isn't correct, write us back. <laughs> yeah. No, I think you're right. I just wanted to, uh, you know, clarify. Yeah. So, okay. Um, both of those things, the copper coil and the birth control pill, are powerful enough that they will override any benefits that progesterone might provide in terms of being more likely to be pregnant. The other thing is, if you really don't want to be pregnant, this is not a foolproof birth control method, so please do not sue me if it doesn't work and you get pregnant anyway. But the reason why they say to stop at day one of your cycle taking progesterone and continue, because it's kind of a pain, like for women, I, I already know, like uh, if it works, and it doesn't work for all women because sometimes it's more complicated, and Dr. Miriam will address that, but if it works, it's like, oh, great, it's helping me to be more calm and now I have to stop taking it for 10 days. It's not ideal, right, to have to stop every month or eight days or whatever. Uh, so why do you have to stop? Well, you only have to stop because you want to uh, keep being open to procreating. But if you really don't want to procreate for now, if you take high doses of progesterone every day, when I say high doses, I mean the amounts recommended, it actually shouldn't be possible for you to get pregnant. So again, don't, sue me don't you know base anything 
uh, on it. But if anything, I would say if you don't want to get pregnant, you could just take the progesterone every day. It will reduce your adrenaline. It will make you feel more calm and it will reduce your chance of getting pregnant. Reduce, but not stop. So, you know, don't see that. Don't use it as your only birth control method. But I would say it would help to reduce your chance of getting pregnant if you have the progesterone every day. Beautiful. <clears throat> And next one comes from Jennifer792. Ideally, how soon does a person need to eat breakfast in the morning after waking up? Within an hour, ideally. That's really what I try and stick to. Um, again, it depends a little bit on your goals. If you are, if your adrenaline is low and you're metabolically super healthy and you feel hungry and you purposefully want to spike growth hormone and spike cortisol and get some autophagy going and recycle some cells and all that kind of stuff by all means do that right but that should be for a specific purpose for a specific period of time rather than a daily habit so unless you're specifically trying to not eat then i would say yeah within an hour um big banky b again i was reading studies that said that topical progesterone converts to allopregnenolone is this a good or bad thing and is it accurate uh, it does to some degree, but the consensus generally is that sub, um, oral progesterone turns into allopregnanolone a lot more. That's what Dr. Michael Platt was saying and why he personally prefers the um, topical progesterone on the skin rather than in the mouth, basically. Uh, because although allopregnanolone is a wonderful anti-stress compound, if you are stressed, it is really more effective than anything other than an addictive drug uh like you know prozac or not prozac sorry like uh, xanax or whatever valium it's more effective than anything other than those arguably but the one downside to it is just like those it is sedating especially in excess so first thing in the morning you might not want to be stressed but you might also not want to be sedated because you've got stuff to do so that's where the progesterone uh, transdermally is going to be better topically transdermally on the skin is going to be better uh, at night uh, I would say it makes a lot like and I mean literally at night you know maybe an hour before you plan to sleep it would make sense more sense to do oral progesterone because it would help you to rest and sleep wonderful beautiful uh, okay we don't consent 2764 how do babies survive on milk is raw milk okay uh, I'm guessing this is around the vitamin A topic because uh, I think so. Yeah, I, I'm assuming so. Uh, how do babies survive on milk? Because I, I think there's more than one question about breast milk that I saw that's all about this vitamin A issue. People are incredulous about the vitamin A could be bad because it is in breast milk. Um, so let me just suggest that in general and that may be the answer to <laughs> some of the other questions you picked as well. Um, just because it's in breast milk doesn't mean it's good. So I know that breast milk is and ideally is a complete food and it has everything that a baby needs. And I say ideally because if the mother doesn't have the raw material, if the mother is depleted in certain amino acids or essential fats or vitamins or whatever, the mother can't magic it out of thin air. But the mother's body does sacrifice itself for the sake of the child. So if it's got any of it, then it will probably try and put it in the milk for the child. So I realize that breast milk is very, very beneficial. Um, I know it has all kinds of immune factors, you know, immunoglobulins as well, not just the colostrum, not just the first, but on an ongoing basis. Uh, I don't know if you saw the pictures, uh, Chrissy, of uh, before and after when a baby was sick. So before the milk was white and then uh, the next day, after the mother senses that the the baby is ill, then it became like a, a yellow color. And it was because it was full of these uh, immunoglobulins, which were supporting the immune system. So yeah, it's interesting that based on whatever, whether it's scent or, or the saliva being absorbed through the skin or something, some kind of feedback mechanism, the mother's body can sense that there is an issue with the child and adapt the um food for them so all of that is true and all of that is amazing however what we also know to be true is that uh there isn't some magic screen that stops toxins going into breast milk i was gonna say because we still can pass toxins through the breast milk as well 
And everyone knows this. What, what, why are mothers not supposed to drink alcohol if they're breastfeeding? Because the alcohol will go into the, right into the breast milk. Why are mothers not supposed to uh, drink coffee you know, right before? Because it will go straight into the breast milk. So if that's true, which it is, and everyone agrees on it, then why would you assume that just because something is in the breast milk, therefore it must be a nutrient like vitamin A? It could just be a toxin that is being passed into the breast milk. So... Toxins set up in breast milk too. I think that's the uh, the simple answer. And then the question about, was it raw milk? Yeah, is raw milk okay? Uh, this is a controversial one. It's quite interesting. Um, there was a Rothschild, I think Jacob Rothschild, who was a member of the House of Lords in the United Kingdom. And he literally only, uh, I think he either voted twice or introduced a bill twice. Uh, and one of them was about some kind of war, some kind of big one. And the other one is about pasteurizing milk. <laughs> um, and a lot of people have fairly low opinion of uh, that, uh, that family and their intentions. And um, there's kind of stories about as well about the Rockefeller family and how they, uh, you know, strongly pushed the pasteurization thing. Really talked about the whole controversy of Pasteur versus Bouchamp in um, an episode recently on chronic infections, whether... The problem is the organism, the pathogen, or whether the problem is the terrain of the person receiving them. Having said all that, I'm not 100% convinced that raw milk is always okay. It definitely has benefits. It's not, um, uh, it's uh, still got lactase, the enzyme that helps the person to digest the lactose. I'm sure there are other things that uh, we don't know how to measure or that I don't know about, which are damaged by heat, that it's better to have um, unheated. However, and it's true also that so long as everything is done perfectly, there is no reason why milk would be contaminated with any other kind of pathogenic bacteria. However, there is this thing of human error. You know, people get ill all the time from eating like salads or fruits that are, um, uh, uh, what's the word, contaminated. Con yeah, uh, contaminated, for sure. So from that, and, and, you know, so from that perspective, there is always a danger with raw milk, as much as there is a danger with raw lettuce, that it could be contaminated. And if you're just consuming it, that you could become very sick from it that is possible i know you know holder clark who was one of the grandmothers i guess of the naturopathic move <laughs> movement in the uh, uh western world she was a big fan of always making sure that you boiled milk because she said it was you know always contaminated with i think shigella was one of the bacteria that she was concerned about um so i don't think this is something that's clear cut i would say if your immune system is very good you're more concerned with uh, like an autoimmune issue, like an allergy or an intolerance or something rather than a pathogen, then definitely raw milk would make more sense. I would say it's, you know, probably as safe as having raw beef, which I know a lot of people like to do, or raw eggs, probably maybe safer than raw eggs. Definitely safer than eating some stuff. Like I see people eating raw chicken, raw pork. They, <laughs> some of them say they've done it every day for years and they're totally fine. So, you know, obviously things are on a scale, right? It's I don't think it's such a big deal compared to a lot of things. But um, if you're trying to be, if, you, if your health is fragile and you're trying to be super careful, I wouldn't do it. I remember being in a restaurant once is the only time I, maybe the waiter was new and I ordered chicken and he said, how would you like that, that cooked? I was like, cooked. I like it cooked. <laughs> I was Thoroughly. like, oh, I had no idea you had options with chicken. But, <laughs> but oh, goodness. Um, we do have another uh, question from, we do not consent to 764 because he's, uh, he's saying, or she, sorry about that. Um, berberine is a carotenoid. Are you endorsing vitamin A supplements, supplements now? Uh, yeah, berberine is not a carotenoid. Um, it is a uh, alkaloid. I, I think I remember I looked it up. But anyway, it's definitely not a carotenoid. Um, it is a bright yellow pigment. And so for that reason, an argument could be made by like someone in the carnival community or someone in you know Dr. Smith's uh, camp or community. I'm sure that it's not it's innately not good, but I'm putting it more in the same category as I uh, said earlier. I'm generally not a fan of brightly colored plant chemicals, and I don't make them a staple part of my diet. But I'm also not fanatical about it, and I'm happy to use them for specific medicinal purposes. And so. 
Uh, I don't know if we're talking about berberine in terms of insulin resistance or if we're talking about it in terms of AMPK activation or something like that. But these are all specific medicinal strategies that you would want to use for short to medium term. Um, and so, yeah, I stand by that. And no, it's not a carotenoid. I'm 100% sure about that. Wonderful. And we've got uh, Jennifer Griffin, 5467. She's saying, wow, fascinating. I've never heard of Dr. Pete. Just bumped into this. Wondering how this could even be considered for someone with cancer. Any recommendations further for further info on this? Thank you. Yeah, I don't comment on cancer. Uh, I just retweeted something recently, which I thought was a good summation of the Ray Pete uh, f school of thoughts approach to that. Um, and I would recommend uh, Mark Sloan. He has two books on this. First of all, like one book debunking the mainstream approach to it. And then a second book uh, expl explicating the rapey approach to dealing with that particular diagnosis. And so I would refer you to his work. Um, it is <laughs> ridiculously cited. I think it's like a 500 page book, the second one out of which more than 350 pages of citations. <laughs> I, thought I, was, I thought I was sitting down to read this huge book and actually tend, it was actually quite short and concise and to the point, just with tons of citations. Um, and actually that book, I mean, it's got a big section on like the benefits of orange juice and coconut oil. I think the actual explanation about the bioenergetic, the Ray Peat type of bioenergetic approach to that issue is only like 40, 50 pages or something like that. So he explains it very concisely in the second book of that series. Obviously, if you are interested in the, um, you know, the refutation of the usual approaches to that diagnosis, then you would also check out the first book. But yeah, that would be my recommendation for uh, hearing a informed and thoroughly cited uh, answer to that question. <laughs> Wonderful. And the next one comes from Vaca Loca 5575. Very interesting about phosphatidylserine. Can it upset the digestive system? Anything can, uh, but I have not heard about that specifically upsetting the digestive system. No, I've heard more about phosphatidylcholine doing so because it produce, can produce TMAO um, if used orally. And so I guess phosphatidylserine might have the same issue, but generally the amount of, I'll just shorten it, the, of PS that you would use is a lot less than PC. Uh, so I would not consider that to be an issue. And as someone who had a very sensitive digestion, still has quite a sensitive digestion, I've never had an issue with it. But everyone's different, so uh, it's possible, but I doubt it. And we're hearing from Sullivan Kelly 85 again, just uh, wanted to say this is by far the best health podcast I've come across and there have been many. I appreciate you both. Um, then yeah, CL, yeah, thank you, Sullivan. Um, CLS uh, Kells, I think it's spelt uh, with some different things. I want to second that by far the best health podcast I've come across too. There have been many also have left a five star review. Uh, thank you, Owen and Chrissy for delivering videos often, Catherine. Oh, that reminds me. Yeah, please leave reviews. If you're listening to this on Spotify, uh, leave reviews. I know it's not always obvious. I was actually, someone pointed this out to me. I was trying to find how to leave a review on Spotify. Uh, it was not super obvious. <laughs> and I can't guide you on how to do it. And I know you have to like, they make sure you've actually listened to the episode. They don't just let you do it straight away, which is good, I guess. Um, but yeah, please, if you're listening to Spotify, please leave a rev uh, review for the podcast there. If you're listening to Apple Podcasts, please leave a review of the podcast there. If you're on YouTube, please subscribe, uh, you know, like, comment, share. Uh, if you're on Rumble, uh, do it there. Like, it, it, we really appreciate it. Obviously, yeah, we do this for free. We're not charging you anything. Um, we, we promote, you know, our own company's uh, products on here. Uh, but other than that, you know, we, we've we made zero profit from this. In fact, quite the opposite, you know, about a year in now. We do it because we want to help people. We want to get the message out there. And so we're not asking for any money in return. But if you would be so good as to uh, take your time, which I guess time is money. So uh, take a little bit of your time, leave us a review, uh, share it with people, then that's really appreciated. And thank you so much for that person who uh, said that they had. Well, Owen, this has been great. We have many more questions to come, so we'll move that to a part two of our Q&A. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Please remember to hit the like and subscribe button so that you don't miss an episode, and we'll see you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode, 
And one of the ones I'd recommend is just here, if you wanna click there, or another one I recommend is just below, if you wanna click on that one and watch that next.